the discourse from King Benjamin. He says the atonement, which has been prepared from the foundation of the world. So it's not just happening when 2000 years ago, but way, way before, right? So from the foundation of the world, that salvation may come to him that should put his trust in the Lord and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith even into the end of his life. Isn't that the, the whole plan here? That's what Christ fulfilled? It is, and, that, and that's why Jacob is talking about the power of the resurrection and the power of the atonement. The power of the resurrection is going to get our physical body back and get us back to the presence of God. The power of the atonement, if we exercise faith under repentance, will help our confidence wax strong in the presence of God. Now, when we think of that, people often say, well, I, I committed another sin, therefore Christ had to suffer a little bit more than I, you know, more today because of me, or I kicked the dog, whatever, whatever it happens to be. We sometimes think that Christ suffers for every sin that we commit. Again, it's not the actions. One sin will keep you from the presence of God if you don't repent of it. One sin, just one. And so it's not the acts that we commit, it's the character that we develop that keeps us from the presence of God. And it's what Christ sacrificed, what his atonement did. And, and this is what Alma 34 is trying to say in, the, in those four verses, there, is that the atonement will satisfy the demands of justice, not having to suffer for every single sin that we've done, but it will satisfy the demands of justice wrapping us in the arms of safety so that our confidence can wax strong in the presence of God until we have the, the time required to develop the character that is worthy to be in the presence of God. Because character has to be developed by agency. Agency runs supreme. God, God will not and Satan cannot control the agency of man, said Joseph Smith. And we are saved not just by the atonement, by the mercy we can be in the presence of God, but it's our agency that we use to develop the character that remain that, that is worthy to remain in the presence of God. So agency is, is a power that we don't we don't often talk about or don't even understand. Every single ordinance we participate in, every single one of them, means nothing if we don't use our agency to change our character. You can be baptized a thousand times, you can participate in the endowment or any other ordinance. A million times, but if we don't use our agency to change our character, those ordinances mean nothing, no matter what priesthood leader performed those ordinances. It doesn't matter. If its agency is the initiating and the uh, power, the, the effectualizing power that lies behind every single ordinance. And so we have to change our character. And that's what this whole concept is of exercising faith unto repentance means faith unto the change of character. And mercy steps in. If we are exercising faith unto the change of character, then the atonement aspect, resurrection gets us to the presence of God with a physical body. But if we are exercising faith unto the change of character, then mercy steps in. And as it says in verse 16 there of this particular verse, and then if mercy steps in, then mercy will satisfy the demands of justice and, ex and encircles them in the arms of safety. While he that exercises no faith unto uh, repentance is exposed to the whole law of the demands of justice. And that is to be cast out from the presence of God. That's justice is no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God. And there are scriptures in the Book of Mormon that say that. I mean, this almost literally. So anyway, grace, grace is there, saves us from the fall of Adam, and the atonement saves us from ourselves. Mercy saves us from ourselves, if we exercise faith under repentance. And so those are the two aspects of Christ's life, and those are the two aspects that we participate in in the initiatory. For no man cometh unto the Father, except they come through Jesus Christ, and what we... and coming through Jesus Christ is through the resurrection, the anointing, and through the atonement or the washing. Anyway, that's just food for thought. Wow. I'm sure we could talk for a long time about these concepts. And um, I'd like to continue this maybe in another section, Bruce. If we have time, we still need to 
I would think, like to talk more about uh, the relationship that Christ had with Peter and Peter had with Christ after his his actual resurrection. There was 40 days that they that Christ taught the apostles after his resurrection. Not much in our New Testament about that, but uh, there is a relationship that Peter had with, with Christ that allowed him to become the president of the church at that time. I think I think there's a couple of things in these passages for come follow me this uh, in, in this uh, this week. One is is what happens on the road to Emmaus, and the other one is what happens uh, at the Sea of Galilee with Peter. Right. Um, and those those two concepts uh, in these passages this week I think are very important. And there's I think there's something interesting on the road to Emmaus. I mean it's just a few miles. I think Emmaus was like three miles or something like that out of Jerusalem as the crow flies. And, um, uh, the town there, the, the traditional place of the Emmaus is a town today called Abu Ghosh. Been there many times. I've eaten there often. But uh, in the story in uh, of the the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke uh, in Luke twenty four, um, uh, starting in verse thirteen, it says the two of them that same day went to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. This is in verse thirteen fourteen. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. They're talking about the events. The scriptures are talking about uh, Christ. They're talking about all these different things. And in verse 15, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew, ne drew near to them and went with them. Now, th to me, this is a great movie. This is a great movie. I don't know whether Christ is walking faster than them <laughs> or whether he's slowing down so they catch up to him, or whether he's under a tree, but... Somehow, the two disciples and Christ uh, get together as they go. And that says their eyes were closed uh, in verse 16. Their eyes were holding that they should not know him. And Christ says to him, he says, what are you guys talking about today? Uh, why, are, why are you walking and why are you so sad? What's going on in your life? And one of them said, whose name was Cleopas, uh, said to him, are you, what, are, are, you, are you from out of town? Are you a stranger? Don't, don't, don't you have any idea what, what's gone on? I, I mean, you know, do you not read the papers or watch the news? What, you don't know what's happened these last few days. And Christ says to him, what are you, what things, what are you talking about? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet and mighty word and deed uh, with all the people. And then they said, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. Now we talked about how the priests were responsible for the death of Christ, not the Jewish people. And that's what it says here. It said it twice in John, in, in the previous chapter, or in uh, chapter 19 of John, it said it twice, that if the high priest delivered him here, and here he's saying it, and now, now the disciples are saying it on the road to Emmaus in verse 20, the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. They're trying to save their own skin. But we trusted that he should have redeemed Israel. Uh, beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Now, it's bringing up this concept of three days. Three days are an interesting thing. I don't think we talked about this, did we, in this in this no. view here? Three days Three days means um, it has, It pertains to a time uh, uh, that there's going to be a, a change in a person's character or a change in their environment. And if you do a word search for three in scripture, you'll see that this this is always there. Um, um, Jonah has a very uh, uh, change of character while he's three days in the belly of the whale, or the, be the belly of the fish. I shouldn't say whale. Somebody will start complaining about that. But in the belly of this fish, uh, Jonah has a, um, a change of character. Um, we see... Um, uh, King Lamoni and Lamoni's father, three days. Uh, there's a change of character. Um, Alma, three days, a change of character. Uh, we see Christ going into the underworld for three days, um, which is a change of environment. And so he's there and begins uh, teaching or organizing the forces, uh, the priesthood forces to teach in the spirit world. Moses takes the wants to take the children of Israel out uh, from Egypt to go three days into the wilderness uh, in order to offer sacrifices. So uh, three days seem to be an important aspect as part of that that's connected to Abraham, uh, the three days, uh, the travel that they, he goes on to uh, for the sacrifice of Isaac and uh, a number of different things. But three is all three always represents the, 
the change of environment or the change of character, some type of change. Going on. That's, that was the whole worry with Mary and Martha, with Lazarus. He's been dead over three days. You know, it's too late. You know, the opportunity for change is over with. He stinketh now. So, so the three days was a, was a big thing um, anciently. And so in verse 21, he says, we trust what he had done and redeemed Israel. Beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Um, and then they continue on and he they're explaining to Christ what happened. They saw, the women said they saw it. And, <laughs> and then Christ says, he said unto them, O fools, a slow heart to believe all that the prophets have sp spoken. Are you, are, do, you not, do you not know? I, I mean, don't you believe what the prophets have said? Um, and then it says in verse 27, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself, still not knowing who he is. So he uses the scriptures to expound to them who he really is, the fulfillment of those prophecies, um, with, within the Old Testament. See, that was their scriptures. They didn't have a New Testament. They didn't have anything else. All they had was the Old Testament scripture. And so Christ is using those Old Testament scriptures to expound the prophecies concerning himself and how they have been, how they have been uh, fulfilled. And so he's using the scriptures. That's why Paul, Paul always had uh, two stops, and we'll be talking about this later. When he went into a city, when Paul was in his missionary journeys, he always had two stops. The first one was the synagogue, and the second one was always prison. But he always went to the synagogue because he had common ground. He had... Um, he had some, he, he, they were using the Old Testament scriptures. And so Paul would always begin with the Jewish communities because they were using the same scriptures. The other people didn't believe in those scriptures. The pagans in these cities, uh, in these Roman cities, uh, didn't believe in those scriptures. And so Paul would have to be basically talking to atheists in order to try to get them to convert to the gospel, where the common ground that he had with the, with the, with the Jews within the synagogues was the Old Testament. That's why we today, we, we'll never change the Bible. We'll never add anything to the Bible or take anything from it because we have to have common ground in which to communicate the gospel or to teach the gospel to those of um, the, the Christians that are out there. What we have to learn today is going to be completely different. And then a lot like Paul did speaking to the, um, um, uh, to the Gentiles is we now are going to have to teach or figure out how to teach to atheists, people who don't believe in God, or want even want to believe in God, and so we're gonna be, we're gonna be losing the common ground of Christianity to a world of atheism that's gonna have to change our whole way of teaching. Um, but Ammon and, and um, Aaron Aaron were able to do that among the Lamanites. We'll see in the Book of Mormon. But Christ begins using the Scriptures to teach teach to the um, teach to the to the these men on the road to Emmaus. And he says in 27, beginning of Moses and all the prophets, he expounded himself in the scriptures, the, the things concerning himself. And when they got to the village, he went in and made as though he would have gone for it further. But they said, no, we want you to stay with us. The evening, it's evening, the day is far spent. Why don't you, why don't you spend the night with us? And then in verse 30, there's some interesting things that take place here. In verse 30, he says, it came to pass, he sat, he sat at meat with them, and then he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to him. Now that was unusual. They got they get to their home, they get to they get to their house. Now it is the homeowner's responsibility to break the bread and bless it. Not not the, not, yeah. not the stranger. It's not the stranger that is coming into the home. But here they get there. They invite Christ to stay, and he takes the bread. Um, in verse thirty, in verse thirty, it says, and he takes the bread and set at meat with them. He took the bread and blessed it and break and then gave into them. And then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. <laughs> Boy, to, to, to me, this, this, whole, this whole event, this whole scene would make a great, great little movie, just a great movie clip as they approach him. They're on the road and Christ catches up with them and they don't know who he is. He starts talking about the scriptures he wants to continue on, and they convince him to stay. He comes into the house, and then he basically takes over. He takes the bread. He blesses it. And then their eyes are opened, and he vanishes. Now, I would like to think that as he breaks that bread and passes it to them, as he hands them that bread, 
that what makes their eyes open are the signs in his hands of the cross. And their eyes are opened and he vanishes. What a great story. What a, what a great, great story this is. So, Anyway. Wow. Yeah. Um, so I, I I think I think there's some I think there's some things to learn here just for ourselves. You know, we should look at these scriptures and try and liken them to ourselves. What are we doing? Are we concerned with Christ? Are we talking about Christ? Are we always remembering Christ? What are we doing to remember Christ? Are we looking at the scriptures? Are we trying to open up the scriptures? Are we trying to see Christ in the scriptures? Are we trying to see our character change in the scriptures? And do we recognize his words? The words burned within him. They, they opened up the scriptures. They were understanding about Christ. Are we trying to do that? Are we trying to do the same thing? Are we just checking the boxes that I read my scriptures today? I mean, that was the question uh, <laughs> that uh, Nephi asked Laman and Lemuel. Are, are, have you searched the scriptures? Are you reading the scriptures? Have you inquired of the Lord about these scriptures, about these truths? Are we doing the same thing? And that's what Christ says to the, these two men on Emmaus. You know, do you not understand the words of the prophets and what they've said about him, about this man not revealing himself? And so there's things we need to be doing. What are we doing to understand and know Christ, know who he is and what he's done? So anyway, there's a great, there's, I think, some great lessons here on the road to Emmaus. And I think, I think life is a road to Emmaus. And are we walking with Christ? Are we learning of Christ? Are we doing it through the scriptures or are we not on our road to Emmaus? Verse one of chapter 21, he says, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. Not the first time, but. Okay, so this what happens. Christ, Christ told them beforehand, told the apostles beforehand, I'll, I'll meet you in Galilee. And so they go up to Galilee. Well, most of the apostles, most of the apostles were that had been chosen in the Galilee area were fishermen to begin with. And so waiting for Christ uh, to come, not knowing when he's coming and where they're supposed to meet him. Peter, like you said, said, let's go fishing. Well, what, what is there better to do when you have nothing to do than to go fishing? What a great thing to do. But Peter is a fisherman by trade. And so, and, and so are some of the other apostles are all from the fishing village close by, or most of them are from the fishing village close by, not all of them. But they say, well, let's go fishing. So um, they get into the ship in verse 3. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately that they might, and they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, um, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew that it was not Jesus. They were too far out. They were too far away um, to, know, to, know that it was, to know that it was Jesus, that, to know that it was Christ. When it's morning, it says in verse 4, and, and when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Now, now when morning, that means they're out, in, they're out at night. And on the Sea of Galilee, even today, you fish at night on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, at night and very, very early in the morning before dawn, before the, before the sun comes up, before it starts to warm up. So it's in the morning. Jesus stood on the shore, but his disciples knew that it was not Jesus, as we see in verse 4. And then, then, then Christ says unto them, have you caught any meat? Have you caught any fish? And they said, no, we haven't caught anything. Now he's across the water. Now where he's at, there's, there's some springs. There's some hot springs. It's called Tadka. Um, sometimes it's called Peter's Primacy. The Tadka are right next to each other. But there's hot springs that come out because it's all volcanic area in that, uh, in that area around the Sea of Galilee. It's all volcanic area. And there's hot springs that come from the from the vulcanization underground, the, the 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 heat that's underground. The whole Sea of Galilee is 600 feet below sea level, and the mountains around it are all volcanic. The Golan Heights is is just a, a gigantic lava lava flow, and so there on the north end of the Sea of Galilee, just west of Capernaum, uh, there's these hot springs that come out. Well, the fish will come to those hot springs because that's where critters grow. That's where things uh, are that the fish like to eat. And so fishermen like to fish around the where the hot springs come in. And so tradition is, is that that's where Christ was and that's where, they, that's where they were fishing. And so Christ says to him in verse 5, he says, uh, Children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side. Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall and and you shall find it. And they cast therefore. Now they were not able to draw for the multitude of fishes. 
<laughs> and, then, and then we have this note in John. Of course, it sounds like John. Therefore, that disciple who Jesus loved said unto Peter, he didn't say, I said that. He says, the one that Christ really liked a lot, the one that uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, deja vu. Because remember, this is what happened three years before. Christ is out there and he's there on the Sea of Galilee and they're fishing and they haven't caught anything. He says, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now this, this, this is... Uh, this is three years before this happened. I mean, three years before the very same thing happened. They haven't caught anything. Christ says, cast your net on the other side. And they do, and then they bring in the fish. Now, this is what John is saying. John says, well, wait a minute. If you look there, um, if, you look, if you look there at it, he sa uh, when Christ says in verse 6, cast your net on the other side. And then, then John says in verse 7, therefore that disciple who Jesus loved said unto Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, I mean, I'm sure he remembered, he girt his fisher's coat onto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. So why is Peter around naked? Because he's a fisherman. And it's what you do is you throw your nets into the Sea of Galilee, and then one of them, one of the fishermen in the boat, would dive into the, would dive into the sea. They would dive into the sea, and then they would pull that net together to underneath down there they would pull it and tie it together in the water and so so is what we see it says that peter put his puts his clothes on once he knows it's christ he puts his clothes on and then jumps into the sea and then it says and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land which means they're probably close to those uh, warm springs that run in there but as it were, 200, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. And as soon as they come to land, they saw a fire with coals, and thereupon a fish laid uh, with, along with bread. And then Christ says to him in verse 10, Now bring the fish which you have now caught. And they, they drew the net to the land full of great fishes. Now that means big ones. These are big fish. Full of great fishes, 153. For all there were so many that there the yet their net was not broken, which means is what it's saying here is that their net with that many fish, the net should have been broken. And these are big fish. These aren't small fish. These are big fish. And I'm sure Peter is a fisherman is saying, well, this is a pretty good haul. We got it. We, we've been successful here. And somebody counted them 153 great fish. You know, and I don't know what the number means or if it's supposed to mean anything. But there's 153 big fish, great fish, and yet their nets were not broken. And then there's some um, things that are said there. Uh, after, in verse 12, Christ says, Come and dine, come and eat. And none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that, it, knowing that it was him, they were still afraid, almost afraid to talk to him. He says, Take bread and giveth them, and, and they had fish likewise, bread and fish. And this was the third time that Christ showed himself to his disciples. After that, he was risen from the dead. Remember, the first time was in the upper room. The second time was with uh, Thomas after the fact. And then this is the third time. Um, then the interesting thing happens in verse 15. That starts to happen in verse 15. And so when they had dined, Christ said un unto uh, Peter Simon, Son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Well, he's pointing at the fish, no doubt. Here you got 153 big fish. I'm sure they ate some of them. It, said, it sounds like they had a few of them for, for breakfast there. But he says, do you love me more than these? And, and Peter said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He said unto him, then feed my lambs. And then in verse 16, and he said unto him a second time, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And then he said, feed my sheep. First time was lambs. Second time was sheep. And then he said unto, in, unto him the third time, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Now Peter at this time was getting a little upset and Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, when he said the, th uh, the third time, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And then, G then Christ says to him again, feed my sheep. Now, if you remember that three times Christ is asking him if he loved him. 
about a week before, just a few days before, maybe not even a week before, Christ told Peter that when Peter said, I won't let anything happen to you because I love you so much, I won't let anything happen to you, Christ told Peter that, that his love wasn't such yet that he would still deny him at least three times. So you have Peter denying Christ three times in Jerusalem at the time he was arrested. And now Christ is asking him three times, do you love me more than these? Well, what are these? What are these that he's talking about? The things that he's talking about are the fish. Peter's a fisherman. And this is a concept that we need to come back to sometimes. Peter's a fisherman. Do you love me more than your work? your business, your income? Do you love me more than what you do for a living? Do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your, than, than your livelihood? The things that you've done throughout your life? He's only been with Christ for three years and he may have been fishing for 30 years before that. And he says, do you love me more than your business, more than your income? And it just so happened, this was one of the biggest hauls they'd ever seen. 153 great fish. Now, no doubt a fisherman's thinking in his mind, okay, how much am I going to get out of this haul? And so Christ is asking Peter, he says, do you love me more than you love this, your business, more than you love your income, more than you love uh, that which you know how to do and to do it well? Are you willing to give your life, your time, and your talents up because of your love for me? And so Christ is, at, Christ is asking him these things. And I think he's asking him three times because three times Peter denied him in Jerusalem. And then we have to ask ourselves the same question. We have to ask ourselves the same question. Are we, do we? love Christ more than our life, more than our livelihood, more than our income, more than uh, what's taking place when we have opportunities? Do we love him more than those things? And if so, then the question is, how do we feed the sheep? We can say, well, that's because he's an apostle, he has it different. But the scriptures say over and over again, what I say unto one, I say unto all. How much do we really love him? And I mean, we mentioned it before. If you know what the work and glory of God is, what does it mean to have an eye single to the work and glory of God? And are we willing to sacrifice our life for the sheep that we are to bring, for our responsibilities to that work and glory? And we all have a responsibility to that work and glory, whether we know it or not. And what are we willing to give up? Lovest thou me more than these? is the question that's being asked. So anyway, just food for thought. So.